pseudogenes and function, part two. We've been discussing two papers, one very briefly, uh, evolution news. We'll come back to that at the end of this one. Uh, Nature Review Genetics Pseudogene Function is Prematurely Dismissed in January 7 of this year. Um, the paper that they're talking about is uh, Nature Review Genetics Overcoming Challenges and Dogmas to Understanding the Function of Pseudogenes. And um, you can look at the abstract, anybody, if you happen to be, have a Nature Review Genetics um, subscription or if you happen to be in a university that gets the journal, which this one does, uh, you can get the whole article. The abstract, again just to review, pseudogenes are defined as regions of the genome that contain defective copies of genes. They exist across almost all forms of life and in mammalian genomes are annotated in similar numbers to recognize protein co uh, coding genes depending on who you're counting, 8,000 to 13,000 versus 20 to 22,000 uh, regular genes. Um, <clears throat> although often presumed to lack function, growing numbers of pseudogenes are being found to play important biological roles. In consideration of their evolutionary origins and inherent limitations in genome annotation practices, we posit that pseudogenes have been classified on a scientifically unsubstantiated basis. They're called pseudogenes when they're really not, or at least a good share of them are. We ref reflect that a broad misunderstanding of pseudogenes perpetuated in part by the pejorative inference of the pseudogene label, it's a fake gene, um, has led to their frequent dismissal from functional assessment and exclusion from genomic analysis, which shouldn't have happened. With the advent of technolo technologies that simplify the study of pseudogenes, we propose that an objective reassessment of these genomic elements will reveal valuable insights into gen genome function and evolution. And uh, uh, just to review, we've been through the introduction which uh, gives the origin of the name pseudogene and it implies that they're without function, fake gene. The truth is more complex than that. Humans are polymorphic for pseudogenes so that it, some of them are um, either being created or destroyed, probably being created uh, uh, right now. Some pseudogenes are transcribed, which means they're not really pseudogenes in that sense. Classification is difficult. Uh, not so much because you can't say that they're, they've got introns or not or stuff like that, but because it's hard to tell whether they have functions or not. Um, uh, the next section is identifying pseudogenes in eukarya, and uh, they mentioned that identifying a region as a pseudogene causes it to be overlooked during various analyses, which means that uh, if it does have a function, you'll never find it. These analyses can be mistaken. Some pseudogenes actually do code for protein, and sometimes truncated pseudogenes can be necessary, including, interestingly enough, in human brains, the thing that makes our brains larger than those of other animals relative to our size, is in fact a pseudogene. Which raises the question, of, is it really a pseudogene? There are uh, functional pseudogenes, there are translated pseudogenes, there are partially translated pseudogenes, there is RNA inhibition by pseudogenes, um, which is necessary uh, for the organism or for some function of the organism. There is influencing of DNA structure during transcription, uh, which covers the one we uh, were most interested in last time, which is the uh, beta hemoglobin pseudogene. Uh, influencing DNA stability, uh, and finally, the production sometimes of short peptides that are meant to be not long protein products like we are expecting usually. Um, and that brings us up to where we are today, which is the caveats of the pseudogene term. In the light of growing, the growing number of examples of pseudogenes that exert biological function, it is important to consider whether a pseudogene has a, that has a demonstrated function should still be considered a pseudogene. 
the original conceptualization of pseudogenes as defective is vague. That is, it does not define whether the term refers to defective with respect to performing the function of the parent gene, or rather that it performs no function. Nevertheless, the non-functionality of pseudogenes remains the dominant and default perception, which is what happens if you call it pseudogenes. An illustrative example is lethe, which is a mouse pseudogene of the ribosomal protein RPS15A. RPS15A is a structural component of the ribosome. That is, ribosomes are made out of proteins and a couple of long strings of RNA all put together, and this is one of the proteins that uh, composes the ribosome. Whereas lethe is a long non-coding RNA that binds to and inhibits NF kappa B signaling in innate immunity. Lethe is clearly defective with respect to ribosomal function, doesn't work there, but has an important biological function. It's involved in the immune system. Should lethe be considered a pseudogene or a long non-coding RNA gene or both? Is a notch 2NL that's the one on brains that we mentioned briefly. A pseudogene not, due to not fulfilling the function of notch two, or a gene as it is translated into a functioning protein, a definitely importantly functioning protein. Differentiating genes from pseudogenes is further complicated by polymorphic pseudogenes that are defective in the reference genome but intact in some individuals. Such examples preclude a simple delineation between gene and pseudogene. The definition of function is a complex and often controversial concept in biology. Although many pseudogenes may not have a detectable function that currently affects cellular or organismal fitness, their existence may have an evolutionary role. Genes fu gene function runs along a continuum from that of essential biological function uh, through to enabling a platform for the long-term ter fitness of an organism. Maybe it will supply uh, something for uh, uh, evolution to work on. Remember the people who wrote, the, the, write this, wrote this article are thoroughgoing evolutionists. An example of a long-term evolutionary role is genetic redundancy where a given biochemical function is redundantly encoded by two or more genes. The notion of genetic redundancy as an evolutionary mechanism to provide resilience is contrary to the concept of pseudogenation, which presumes gene copies are functionless. Given the extent of genome annotation impacted by these contrasting hypotheses, there is a surprising lack of debate around these opposing perspectives in the scientific literature. Nobody wants to touch that one. Another point in the spectrum of biological functionality is the potential for a genomic region to evolve new function over time. An illustrative example is the Eutherian, that's true beast, uh, uh, mammals that uh, are not uh, uh, marsupials and that are not uh, things like echinoderms uh, and uh, uh, are not monotremes, the regular mammals, eutherian. Dosage compensation RNA exist, exist, which is critical for inactivation of one of the two X chromosomes in female somatic cells. Uh, if you're a female, you have two X chromosomes and you really shouldn't have two functioning X chromosomes. So one of them is arbitrarily uh, taken out in each cell. And so this cyst helps to do that. Evolved from the pseudogenation of the ancestral LNX3 gene. Now, how do they know that? Because the, uh, the uh, sequence is similar and obviously you couldn't have guessed it by random chance, so therefore it must have been copied. Um, a design perspective views that slightly differently. 
It is probable that LNX3 lost protein coding capacity. It was probable that 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 LNX3 lost protein coding capacity prior to the evolution of a dosage compensation function. During this period, the pseudogene was probably dispensable for organismic survival, but provided the evolutionary substrate for biological innovation. At least 55 conserved human lung non-coding RNA similarly have, appear to have evolved from ancestral protein, protein coding genes. They had a function, they lost it, they picked up a new function. At least that's the way evolution is supposed to work. Skipping over a few things. Experimental challenges, the extent to which pseudogenes contribute to organismal biology remains largely unclear. In addition to the demotivating into exploring pseudogene function by the a priori assumption that they are functionless, you don't think they're there, you don't bother. Their systematic study has also been hindered by a lack of robust methodologies capable of distinguishing the biological activities of pseudogenes from the functions of the genes from which they are derived. You inactivate the pseudogene, you also inactivate the gene uh, that's very close to it, and so uh, it's hard to tell uh, whether you're, uh, the effect you have is from the gene or from the pseudogene. The scenario is reminiscent of, and in many regards analogous to, the challenges that the long non-coding RNA field underwent following the initial observation of their pervasive transcription in mammalian, gen mammalian genomes. Long non-coding RNAs were similarly dismissed initially as emanating from junk DNA. And notice that this is a pattern, and um, ask yourself where it comes from, or as transcriptional noise, largely by virtue of their definition as non-protein coding, and therefore, of course, non-functional, and were challenging to study due to their generally lower and more restricted expression patterns relative to um, messenger RNAs which do code for protein. Following a combination of technology developments, genome-wide studies, and detailed biochemical studies, long non-coding RNAs are now routinely included in genome-wide analyses, and their functional potential as cellular regulators is widely recognized. I think ENCODE had something to do with some of that. Key among these advances was the shift away from targeted microarrays which measured expression only of annotated genes, to largely unbiased transcriptome sequencing approaches, which could detect expression of long non-coding RNAs. Now, you didn't know it was even there, you didn't know that it was doing anything. In retrospect, it is likely that advancement of both practical and theoretical heuristics was pivotal in the proliferation of research in long non-coding RNAs and their ascent in modern genome biology. They're now known to be important. By contrast, due in part to the experimental challenge of investigating their function and expression, pseudogenes are typically excluded from genome-wide functional screens and expression analysis. They've been labeled as pseudogenes, therefore we know what they do, or more precisely what they don't do, and so we can ignore them. And maybe we really shouldn't. Detection of pseudogene expression. An illustrative example of the potential for pseudogene functionality is the unexpected observation that processed pseudogenes are commonly expressed. Processed pseudogenes, those are the ones with um, all the introns taken out of them, um, were presumed to have been rendered transcriptionally silent by the loss of cis regulatory elements during the tra retrotransposition of mature RNAs. It was not until 2006 that this assumption was first tested by an in silico interrogation of human ESTs, which demonstrated that thousands of retrotransposed gene copies are transcribed and are often spliced into known protein, protein coding transcripts. So they obviously do something and do something worthwhile. So they have function. Um, the next part of that paragraph talks about uh, uh, a new technology, DNA microarray hybridization. 
and goes on to say, however, this approach is unsuitable for the detection of the pseudogene expression, for the, of pseudogene expression. DNA oligonucleotides are typically unable to differentiate a pseudogene from its parental gene or other pseudogene copies due to sequence similarity. They're very similar to each other, hard to tell apart. Precluding unambiguous identification of their transcript levels, because which one is doing it actually. The expression dynamics and specificity of pseudogenes remains, remain largely unknown. It's hard to do this work. Pseudogene RNAs may be erroneously assigned to their parent genes. Long read, long read transcriptomics may be a solution to accurately characterize pseudogene transcription. However, current limited throughputs of nanopore and particularly PacBio, which are ways of, of characterizing uh, long DNA sequences, uh, may restrict the quantifications of lowly expressed pseudogenes. I, I think that that means ex uh, pseudogenes that are uh, expressed in low numbers. Um, experimental perturbation of pseudogenes. So if you can't study what's actually happening inside the cell, one way to do it is to change the DNA. The use of assays ill-suited to analysis of pseudogenes is arguably stymied elucidation of their biological roles. Can't figure out what they're doing because they're using tools that aren't very good. Although antisense oligonucleotides targeting splicing sites may be able to specifically inhibit parental genes without targeting their process pseudogenes, which do not contain the exon intron junctions, targeting pseudogenes without hitting the regular genes remains challenging. Uh, CRISPR-based innovations represent a revolution in our ability to systematically determine the functions of pseudogenes. Uh, CRISPR enables the relatively straightforward introduction of mutations or deletions into eukaryotic genomes. You can, put, you can change anything you want to pretty much if you have the right enzyme to do it. For putatively translated pseudogenes, targeting sequences that are divergent from the parent gene may be a feasible approach to introducing frame-shifting indels. Dear, despite the short spacer sequence length of CRISPR-Cas9 guides, cleavage is largely intolerant of mismatches proximal to the protospacer adjacent motifs or PAM site thus allowing specific targeting of pseudogenes. You can find specifically what gene you want and then you can change it. Off-target editing of the parent gene due to partial spatial sequence uh, matches may be further alleviated using dual targeting nucleases or engineered guide RNA with improved specificity. Those are technical uh, things for those who are thinking of actually doing this. In either case, Validating that no mutations are induced in the corresponding parent gene is crucial. So you have to check and see if you did what you thought you did at the end. An alternative strategy to ensure, ensure specificity in targeting a process pseudogene is to design guide RNAs that span exon-exon junctions in the parent gene. As the two parts of the target site are together in the process pseudogene, the guide RNAs will be able to bind, whereas in the parent gene, these sequences will be interrupted by uh, introns and therefore not binding in the same way. Although introducing small indels by targeting a single target site will be efficacious for dissecting the function of the translated pseudogenes, they are unlikely to disrupt pseudogenes that act through DNA-based or RNA-based mechanisms. It helps if you're trying to uh, work on protein, but it doesn't help if you're just doing DNA. By targeting unique flanking genomic sequences with pairs of guide RNAs, pseudogenes can be specifically deleted without risk of mutating their parent parental genes. And of course, if you can do that, then if, if the organism survives without it and doesn't have any uh, uh, loss of function, then you can say it doesn't have a function. On the other hand, you may be able to say that it does have a function if the organism doesn't work as well as it should. When performing pseudogene perturbation studies, it is important to confirm 
that the intended perturbation has been pr achieved, which can be challenging. A lack of overt functional consequences of pseudogene perturbation in one experimental setting does not discount that the pseudogene may still have notable functions in other contexts. So one of the problems you'll have is, are you testing it in the right way? The importance of terminology. And this is the last section before the conclusion. Theoretical terms are central to the development of scientific theories. Unlike physics, which is underpinned by robust foundational axioms that found the basis of new scientific theory, uh, theories, biology lacks a formal framework through which new theoretical terms are defined and adopted in scientific use. Um, biologists have physics envy, I guess. complex things and yes. uh, that has contributed to it, although I must admit I... And they're not nearly as straightforward as physics. I, I admire uh, how easy physical concepts can be defined and worked with. It's, um, it's comforting to know at least part of science is rational. Yeah. Um, Therefore, there is often lacking a, a lack of consensus about the meaning and application of new terms. A consequence of this is that terms in biology can rapidly become apparently axiomatized, despite not having undergone any formal process to obtain community consensus. I, I think it's not just a community consensus. I think it's flat out lack of clear thought. But. Um, this leaves biology vulnerable to developing theoretical constructs on uncertain foundations or obscuring the pursuit of more productive avenues of research. Once you label something, you think you know what's going on, and maybe you really don't. In addition to the untested hypothesis that evolution has left us with a dichotomy between genes and pseudogenes, and maybe the difference is not that clear cut, uh, <coughs> The term pseudogene itself asserts a paradigm of non-functionality through its taxonomic construction, pseudos, gene. Pseudogenes are defined as defective and not genes. This point is highlighted because impartial language, now this last, this sentence here I think should read because not Im, non-impartial language, but uh, the way it's read is, uh, this point is highlighted because impartial language in science is known to inherently restrict the neutral investigation between conflicting paradigms. And I think that they mean non-impartial. And um, the reference, by the way, is Thomas Kuhn, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. In the case of pseudogenes, the term itself is constructed to support the dominant paradigm and therefore limit, consciously or unconsciously, scientific objectivity in their investigation. One of the most well-recognized instances of poorly rationalized axiomatization impacting scientific advance was the introduction of the term prokaryote in 1962 to define all non-nucleated life forms as a distinct phylum. Up to this time, microbiologists had struggled to realize an overarching phylogenetic framework to order bacterial life, and accordingly, a convenient assertion that bacteria were a distinct monolithic phylum went by unchallenged, despite a lack of any material evidence that this was the case. And what they're building to, of course, is the introduction of the term archaea um, instead of a bacteria uh, or in addition to bacteria. The grouping of bacteria in a single phylum crystallized the unsubstantiated notion that all bacteria rose from a common ancestor. Ooh. <laughs> but I thought all life rose from a common ancestor. Oh well. Uh, despite the available technical cap ca capability to demonstrate that non-nucleated life was two distinct phyla, archaea and bacteria. It was not until the early 1990s that life on Earth was largely recognized as occurring in three evolutionary domains, uh, with the eukaryotes being the other. So they're drawing a, a, a parallel between 
just making a statement and assuming that it that everything inside of one group was similar enough that the differences could be ignored. The prokaryote hypothesis persisted for at least 30 years and left a generation of microbiologists operating under a false assumption that obscured the understanding of microbial evolution for decades. In this context, language, and specifically the premature specification of a term to provide convenience to a complex and poorly understood domain, led to a profound lack of scientific inquisition in a fundamental domain of biology. You label it, you know what it is, you stop asking questions. The blanket assignment of the pseudogene term to a heterogeneous class of elements is also reminiscent of the indiscriminate long non-coding RNA label, which is applied to the 10,000s of non-protein coding transcripts longer than about 200 nucleotides originally identified in mammalian transcriptomes. If it's longer than 200 nucleotides, it's in this category, and we just know what it does. By over-hastily classifying pseudogenes as a homogeneous class, we similarly risk trivializing the complexity and diversity of potential functions and conduct and conduct unnuanced approaches to their characterization. The relative infancy of genome biology leaves the domain vulnerable to the adoption of terms that become axiomatic for the sake of simplicity and convenience rather than through scientific grounding. In the case of pseudogenes, the original use of the term rapidly proliferated to encompass a heterogeneous class of genomic elements. And in fact, if you go back, you find out that the first example was wrong. Um, Despite early attempts to provide a systematic and scientifically grounded nomenclature to these genomic elements, the term pseudogene became widely used to describe a potentially defective copy of a gene, and pseudogene identification became a routine process in the annotation of genomes. And remember from last week that we had people who assumed that they knew what they were talking about when they didn't and proceeded to lose their faith partly on that basis. As the absence of functional or function or biological impact cannot be determined by bioinformatic pipelines, that is, you can't look at the numbers uh, or the letters and, and tell exactly what the thing does, the automa automated classifications of gene-like sequences as pseudogenes should be avoided. Instead, we would propose that descriptive terms that do not make functional inferences should be used in reference to genomic elements that arose from gene duplication and retrotransposition. We suggest that the previously turned, coined term retrocopy, which by the way has its own implications, should be adopted for the annotation of retrotransposed elements, and that Gene copy or paralog should be used for gene duplications with appropriate qualifications where, they're, where they are untranscribed or untranslated. And even then they may have function as the hemoglobin B pseudogene definitely has. In cases where such elements are transcribed but do not have discernible open reading frames, they could simply be referred to as long non-coding RNA with some reference to the ancestral prote protein coding gene. Regardless of the nuances of the nomenclature, the overarching principle is that terminology should not impose any unsubstantiated assumption on end users. If you see pseudogene, do not believe it straightforwardly. Concluding remarks. Gene duplication and retrotransposition are crucial, crucial processes that underlie organismal robustness and the evolution of new biological functions and characteristics. These processes sit alongside other evolutionary mechanisms such as meiosis that create the organismal diversity upon which natural selection acts. Like other evolutionary processes, gene, du gene duplication and retrotransposition leave behind observable ancestral signatures that provide insight into an organism's history. In the fundamental reductionist approach often assumed in genetics and molecular biology, the perspective is often lost that life as we observe it today is not only the product of billions of years of evolutionary processes, as I said, these people are evolutionists, 
but also still subject to these same processes. Although pseudogene concepts arose to describe an individual molecular phenomenon, the term was rapidly adopted to annotate tens of, tens of thousands of genomic regions that met only loosely defined criteria and was effectively axiomatized without being the subject of any rigorous scientific debate. This lack of consensus seeking process has left genome biology with a legacy concept that obscures objective investigation of genome function. The purpose of this article is not to discard the pseudogene concept or suggest that all pseudogenes are functional. The majority of currently annotated pseudogenes are neither robustly transcribed nor translated. Such region, regions fit well the original descriptions of pseudogenes as similar but defective. Uh, although maybe they have the same functions as the hemoglobin uh, beta pseudo pseudogene. Rather, we argue that their labeling as pseudogenes is not constructive for advancement of understanding of genome function and misdirects experimental design. The pseudogene term is often used without any qualification. It's a shortcut to thinking. Despite the term being quite absolute in its meaning, that is a defective copy of, of another gene, computational pipelines that annotate pseudogenes have not made any assessment of function. Don't trust them. Rather than the inherent Im limitations of computational annotations being emphasized, computational annotations have become increasingly written into lore through their perpetuation across databases and reference genome annotations that in turn inform the development of algorithms and software use for both research and clinical purposes. Once it gets in there and it gets labeled, it perpetuates itself. The use of a liberal definition of pseudogenes is attractive as it simplifies genomic analyses. This approach, often unknowingly to the researcher, leads to the consolidation of pseudogene classification, that is, their exclusion by convenience in functional studies. Many regions now considered to be dead genes potentially encode cis-regulatory elements, non-coding RNAs, and proteins with impacts on human biology and health. It's convenient, but we're ignoring the truth. Accordingly, further determining the functions of pseudo putative pseudogenes warrants active pursuit by their inclusion in functional screens and analyses of genome, genomic, transcriptomic, and proteomic data. With innovations in long read sequencing and CRISPR-based methodologies now ready, readily accessible, the technological limitations that formerly motivated the exclusion from functional investigation are now largely resolved. So put them back in the analysis. The dominant limitation in advancing the investigation of pseudogenes now lies in the trappings of the prevailing mindset that pseudogenic regions are intrinsically non-functional. Notwithstanding the introduction of a new theoretical framework to consider the evolutionary context and functional role of gene duplication and retrotransposition, the assumptions underlying pseudogene annotations should be carefully questioned in genomic investigations. We propose that the pseudogene label should be used sparingly, preferably only in the context where such a genomic region demonstrably lacks biological activity, and instead the more objective terminology of retrocopy and gene copy, or paralog in the case where the gene is transcribed and translated, should be adopted. With renewed scientific objectivity, we anticipate that a wealth of discoveries to understand genome function, its role in disease, and the development of new treatments is within reach. It's going to be very convenient to have that. Now I'm going to go back to the article that first introduced me to this one. And not the whole article, obviously, just the very conclusion, uh, Evolution News and Views. Um, the paper predicts that as soon as we lose this mindset, that quoting from before the, uh, there, the pseudogenic regions are intrinsically non-functional, there, there will remain no technical limitations blocking us from progress in understanding the function of, of pseudogenes. With renewed scientific objectivity, we just read that not too long. We're going to be able to get that done. That's good news. But we must first ask a question the paper fails to ask. Why did this terminology develop in the first place? Evolutionary thinking. 
a relic of evolution? Evolutionary thinking is the cause that ultimately created, nurtured, and sustained the junk DNA par paradigm, including the pseudogene paradigm. Yet the paper adopts a wholly evolutionary approach and for this reason never identifies evolutionary thinking as the root of the problem. The closest the authors get is when they recount how the very first paper to identify a pseudogene, published in 1977, dismissed its potential function as a relic of evolution. In the absence of evidence that the 5S pseudogenes were transcribed by uh, were transcribed, Jacques et al. concluded that the most probable explanation for the existence of the pseudogenes is that they are a relic of evolution and are functionless. And that was originally a sub subscript, or pardon me, a superscript. And by the time it got to Evolution News and Views, it had migrated down. Uh, a mutation, if you please. Since the coining of the term pseudogene, its definition has broadened and is now widely accepted to define any genomic sequence that is similar to another gene and is defective. I think we read this in, in the first chapter. This 1977 paper by Jacques et al. was published in the journal Cell and found a pseudogene in an African frog. That paper concluded, we are thus forced to the conclusion that the most probable explanation for the existence of the pseudogene is that it is a relic of evolution. During the evolution of the, I think that should be read 5S, I think somebody mistyped that, DNA of Xenopus laevis, um, a gene duplication occur occurred producing the pseudogene. Presumably the pseudogene initially functioned as a 5S, I think, gene, but then by mutation diverged sufficiently from the gene in its sequence so that it was no longer transcribed into an RNA product. And there you have it. The pseudogene is seen as a mere relic produced by mutation until it diverged so much that it was no longer transcribed into an RNA product. This is the classical view, classic view of a pseudogene. Ironically, the 1977 paper went on to speculate that perhaps there is evidence for a function for the pseudogene, but the authors privileged the relic view as the right answer until a function can be proven. Um, Non-functional until proven functional. This evolutionary explanation for the presence of the pseudogene, however, is incomplete by itself in that it ignores the conservation and sequence of the pseudogene and indeed of the entire G plus C rich spacer of, again, I think that's 5S DNA. In an attempt to explain this, it has been suggested that the pseudogene may be a transcribed spacer corresponding to the primary transcript of 5S, I think, RNA, which is a transient pre precursor and is not so far been detected. If this is so, continuing that paragraph, uh, quote, uh, quoting the original article, then most of the G plus C region, region of the 5S DNA uh, would be the structural gene for the 5S RNA. This function, if true, would provide the necessary selective pressure to conserve the sequence of the linker and pseudogene region so that the correct processing of the postulated 300 long precursor was maintained. In the absence of any experimental evidence for such a long precursor, in other words, this could have been functional. But we can't find that it's expressed, so in the absence of the, that expression, this suggestion must be regarded as speculative. It is more probable that the pseudogene is a relic of evolution. And as it turns out, they were wrong at least as, as far as a different species was concerned, uh, it turned out that this thing is useful. Uh, the recent Nature Reviews genetic paper hopes to remedy this problem by reviewing most, much of the overwhelming evidence for pseudogene function and emphasizing how the non-functionality of pseudogenes remains a dominant and default perception, even though it shouldn't be. This will limit consciously or unconsciously scientific objectivity in their investigation. The authors, in fact, are to be commended. However, experience teaches that unless you address the root cause of a problem, it rarely goes away. The tendency to review pseudogenes as a relic of evolution probably won't change as long as you presume that the entire genome is a product of blind evolution. The paper fully endorses the latter view, providing all kinds of narrative gloss that describes pseudogenes, whether functional or not, as retrocopies that arose from gene duplication and transposition. They emphasize, 
In the fundamental reductionist approach often assumed in genetics and molecular biology, the perspective is often lost that life as we observe it today is not only the product of billions of years of evolutionary processes, but also still subject to those same processes. Um, they are welcome to take the reductionist approach often assumed in genetics and molecular biology. But until those fundamental evolutionary views of the genome are on the table for questioning, they won't make much progress in shaking the science-stopping assumption of the junk DNA paradigm, and in particular, the junk DNA status of pseudogenes. Now, my own take on this is I really second the inclusions of the NBV post, which I included for that reason. Remember Dan Grauer in On the Immortality of Television Sets Function in the Human Genome According to the Evolution Free Gospel of ENCODE? The, the two approaches are fundamentally opposed to each other. He went on to make a lecture, which you can get his lecture slides on the internet from, and um, one of the slides is here, it's talking about he doesn't like ENCODE. And there are three problems with ENCODE. And this first one is actually not a problem of ENCODE, it's a problem of uh, the evolutionary process, but let's read it. If the human genome is indeed devoid of junk DNA as implied by the ENCODE project, then a long undirected evolutionary process cannot explain the human genome. Well, <laughs> if on the other hand organisms are designed, then all DNA, or as much as possible, is expected to exhibit function. If ENCODE is right, then evolution is wrong. Grauer is a firm believer in evolution, and that means ENCODE must not be right. And his solution in a later slide is to kill ENCODE. That's a group of no, they're a group of mostly evolutionist scientists, but the, what they're saying is that most DNA actually has function. And so Dan Grauer's whole point is to show that in fact, most DNA does not have function defined the way he defines function. Well, I, thought, I thought the whole uh, junk DNA thing has been, is not occurring. Well, Let's put it this way. Pseudogenes are a piece of junk DNA. If junk DNA has function, then pseudogenes have function. Well, same, same, I, thought, I thought pseudogenes, um, is, I guess. Just a minute, we'll get you a mic here because we want to catch your comments easily. Go ahead. So pseudogenes is a totally different concept than junk DNA? Uh, pseudogenes are a part of junk DNA. Junk DNA has pieces of this, pieces of that, pieces of the other, and some things called pseudogenes. And what this whole article is arguing is that we dismiss pseudogenes too rapidly. And that's important from a historical point of view because pseudogenes were used to prove that chimpanzees and humans had a common ancestor. Um, uh, by use of a, an interesting theological argument, uh, primarily based on the idea that pseudogenes didn't do anything. As it turns out, that particular pseudogene does something, and therefore the, the occurrence of it in both chimpanzees and humans is, is easily written off as the common design feature. Uh, so these, these arguments sound esoteric, but they turn out to have very practical implications. If you believe certain ways, you are not going to investigate certain things, and you're going to believe that, um, that uh, common junk implies a common ancestor, whereas if you don't think it's all junk, then the fact that it's there doesn't mean that you have a common ancestor. It's interesting because you'll notice that 
right next to this thing here, they have the encode symbol, but then they have a book called The Myth of Junk DNA, which if I remember correctly is written by um, Jonathan Wells, um, but it certainly fits in with his, uh, it's certainly a Discovery Institute Press. So uh, Dan Grauer is very, very well acquainted with what's really going on in terms of the uh, uh, creation, evolution, intelligent design controversy. And uh, he is adamantly against not just creation, but intelligent design. Now, as the main article noted, the concept of pseudogenes can be a science stopper. You don't believe they have an, a, a function, you don't investigate for function, you never find the function. As a supplementary article, the one that called uh, to my attention noted, the concept of evolution can be the power behind that particular science stopper. And I think it is even possible that a long age assumption can be a science stopper and was a science stopper for a long time in the investigation of the remains of dinosaurs, which actually are around, but they can't possibly last that long. And I think that we need to keep our minds open on this subject. And I hope that next week when we talk about DNA in stuff from Africa, uh, that we will uh, get an illustration of that particular point. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. In view of uh, his data, that one of the third data, I suppose we should say, uh, can it be a fair question? I, I, you can ask all kinds of questions. We saw examples of all kinds of them that imply uh, conclusion, but can it be a fair question to ask, has any pseudogene been proven to be non-functional? Um, a, a specific... Uh, I mean, it's, it's a fair question because there's so much data that goes in that direction. A specific example does not come immediately to mind. Uh, you can prove that it doesn't have certain kinds of function. No, I mean absolutely none whatsoever. But, um, I mean, the, the, probably the best one I can think of, that uh, the, the way to do this kind of thing in the proper way is to uh, take the pseudogene and snip it out and see what happens. In the case of hemoglobin beta HBB P pseudogene one, which is the the one that uh, that among other things got into Spectrum magazine with Gary Gilbert, um, it turns out if you snip it out, what happens is that uh, people retain fetal hemoglobin and don't move on to the adult hemoglobin at the end when they should. And that's definitely a functional difference and it's definitely, uh, you're better off with adult hemoglobin under the vast majority of circumstances. Um, I, I think that there is some minor advantage to not doing that if you're in a high malaria area but I don't take that to be the original environment. And uh, uh, I think most people would say that, that, that functionally you can do much better with uh, adult rather than fetal hemoglobin. Uh, and uh, so that one functions definitely. Most of what we've done is not of that kind where you take out a gene and you see what happens when it's missing. And uh, this is hard work. And the problem is that you'll find out about the problem 20 or 30 or 40 years before the hard work is done, which means that you have to live your life not knowing the right answer. And 
sort of until that happens, being guided by, if you want to put it that way, your prejudices. And if you're prejudiced that there must be a lot of junk, it's easy to write that off as non-junk, uh, as junk. If you're prejudiced towards there being design, then it's easier to say, well, it probably has a design, we just haven't found it yet. Um, and my personal view is that you're better off betting that it has function rather than vice versa, in general. Which means that uh, the, the philosophical underpinnings behind intelligent design are a better uh, frame of reference than the philosophical und underpinnings behind uh, unguided evolution. And that's saying something that, that neither you nor I will ever know the answer to for many of these things. But don't you feel, maybe, uh, feel I don't like that term. Don't you think? Uh, <laughs> yes, I understand. <laughs> your feelings should follow your thinkings and not vice versa in general. Yes. Uh, don't you think that uh, in view of th this article and its thesis and so on, that uh, that question can be raised on the basis of the data? Well, now it can. Yeah. But 30 years ago, or whatever, 40 years ago, whatever it was when, uh, when Gilbert wrote what he did, and when everybody at Harvard was telling this exactly the same thing, um, it was easy to just go with the scientific flow. What it means is that, that uh, a little historical perspective may be helpful in some of the controversies we have today. Uh, we're not going to have all the answers short of the kingdom. And part of what we are asked to do is to trust when the evidence is not coercive and we're going to have to place our bets ahead of time. And, you know, sometimes you just place your bets and you go on and, 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 and you collect your winnings afterwards. Um, but sometimes placing your bets uh, requires you to actually do something about it. You know, are you going to go to church every week? Are you going to spend a lot of your money on uh, the uh, on trying to advance what you perceive as the gospel, or are you going to live with that being a t peripheral part if if not an ignored part of what you're, uh, you know, how you uh, operate. And that's an important point because you have to make decisions. Uh, I mean, I said this about emergency medicine, but it's true of all of life. You have to make decisions and act on them based on incomplete and inaccurate information. Some stuff you know, you don't know. And some th stuff you think you know that is wrong. And you're going to have to act on it anyway. And that's a tough thing to ask people to do because it's not like I can say, well, I can prove to you that this is what's going on. Because uh, you can't. Uh, you're going to have to live partly on uh, faith, if you like. And that's true whether you go the scientific way or whether you go the religious way. Fact of the matter is nobody has all the answers, uh, at least not on this earth. And you have to ask yourself whether you trust or not. Do you have something more? I'm, I'm Im personally impressed. Uh, I, as I mentioned last week, I when the idea of pseudogenes first hit, in quotes, uh, I looked into it carefully, did a small paper. But I must say, as a creationist, uh, 
the more I thought of it, I just did not see Pseudogene's reality or not as a test case at all. It's relatively integrated into either a well-informed view of creation or as a relic passed on evolutionarily. The information doesn't allow you to come up with any kind of a test case that would separate the two, That, as I understand it. Uh, I'm in closer to my own area of, of activity. Uh, the evolutionary literature is full of proposals that anything in an organism does that it can do in a different way and use less energy will be an evolutionary step. And the data there goes way, way, way beyond any, I shouldn't say the data, the interpretation goes way, way, way beyond any ability to say that a 1% saving in energy will be a crucial evolutionary step. And in some cases, a 0.00001% change in energy. Exactly, which is probably irrelevant as long as there's abundant energy for everybody available. Mm -hmm. And so this looking for crucial test cases on either side is a, I believe it, it can uh, deflect us from more important questions. Because a pseudogene would be a way, in my thinking, of a well-designed pathway for future development, starting with creation, a way of bringing in genetic diversity. And the proposal that a pseudogene can't be real because it supports evolution is simply wrong. Well, I, we think uh, we think that there probably are genes that have been knocked out or partially knocked out and that some of them may actually be da uh, damaging. Um, th there is the curse. Thorns require some gene modification thistles, um, pain and labor, various things that are specifically mentioned as curses, loss of limbs for an animal that used to have them, um, and uh, so the presence of a few pseudogenes is actually com very compatible with a, uh, with a recent creation. Uh, but I think that when you say, you know, let's say maybe 5% of the gene pool is useless versus 95%, then you're probably looking at a, uh, a distinct uh, difference in the outlook. And um, if you read Grauer, he comes up with probably 10%, which is the original Ono proposition and uh, uh, the ENCODE people are looking more like 80 plus percent. So it does make a difference as to how you're looking at the, the general overall thing. I would have to say that I think that the data is supporting ENCODE rather than evolution at this point. I have a comment behind you here. I was struck by the author's description of how language drives theory development and then how based on the theory that's developed, other theories are developed and, and it can all fall apart if the original theory was wrong. I think that that particular section of this article would be well read by any beginning researcher or more advanced researcher. I think they did some outstanding thinking in that part of the article. I agree with you wholeheartedly on that. Uh, I can't tell you how many articles I have read uh, that propose that 
some change happened in uh, uh, in the general global climate because of some um, change in the percentage of pollen that uh, that is con coniferous uh, in Greenland somewhere, and it, it's because when you read the the article they make this assumption and then they make that assumption and they make this assumption and then they make that assumption and then they make this assumption and by the time they get you know four or five assumptions away from the original and then they do the testing on this little narrow area here and you're going and so that proves this and uh, you know it's I guess it's a good way to get your PhD, but uh, <laughs> somehow it seems like a stretch. Well, when you're a budding researcher trying to get your PhD, you have, you're judged partly by the number and the quality of the people that you quote, and you're not necessarily tasked with deciding whether or not what the assumptions m they made were correct. I mean, it would be nice if everybody did, but we know that they don't. But, but I thought these people explained something that I wish that I had read before I helped people get on their get their doctoral degrees. I would I would have required them to read that section. No, it's a great section, and, and you know, pointing out that you call something a fake gene, which is what pseudogene means. And you automatically assume that, okay, this is a fake gene, which of course was wrong, as it turns out. And that means that all of these things are probably fake genes. And so for convenience, rather than saying probably, we'll say certainly. And then these are fake genes, and then by the time you get done, why basically all pseudogenes need not be investigated. And of course, if they're not investigated, nobody ever finds the function for them to begin with. And therefore, you never find out that the whole house is made of cards. And that's a problem. Anyway, come back next week and we will talk about um, African DNA that's still around after thousands of years.